Thank you very much for joining us today. Jordan, the screen is yours. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and so let me do this here. Okay, uh, coming through. Yes. Uh, okay, all right, great. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you again for having me. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, cooperative and competitive machine learning through question answering. So uh, the question that uh, Cornelia asked just a second ago is, is, is very appropriate, that uh, the goal of uh, artificial intelligence is to pass what's called the, the Turing test, where you can have a judge sit down in a conversation with either a human or a computer, and they won't be able to tell the difference. By posing a series of questions to either the human or the machine, they try to figure out which is which, and if they cannot, uh, artificial intelligence has solved, so has been solved. So in, in some sense, question answering is a holy grail of artificial intelligence. It's what we're all working towards. And if you look at, say, uh, a decade ago, you might ask, well, IBM Watson went on Jeopardy and beat uh, two of the greatest players of all time. Does this mean that question answering is solved? And uh, this isn't just um, an academic question for me. So um, I, I am a bit of a nerd, and I have a number of um, eccentric uh, interests. And, uh, Cornelia said she was looking through some of my past coursework, and uh, one of the things that I teach in my natural language processing course is how to do natural language processing on Klingon. And so I, I've studied Klingon a little bit, and uh, I know enough to create part of speech tagging assignments uh, in my natural language processing course. So uh, when, when I went on uh, Jeopardy, uh, this happened. Jordan. What is a clockwork orange? Correct. Uh, college courses for two, please. San Diego State got into linguistic theory in invented languages, this Star Trek one and beyond. Evelyn. What is Klingon? Good. This mean I should know. Yeah, and so... Orange. Correct. Uh, uh, college courses that. for two, please. Uh, San Diego... Okay. Uh, yeah, so this doesn't mean that the person who knows the most uh, answered the question. So uh, I talked uh, to uh, Evelyn, the person who got that question right, after uh, that question came up, and I asked her a question in Klingon, and, and surprisingly she didn't respond. And uh, this shows some of the shortcomings of Jeopardy as a way of showing whether a contestant knows more than the other person. And uh, I'm a bit of a trivia nerd, and one of the things that I've uh, realized is that we need to have some sort of conversation both between the trivia nerds uh, who build things like uh, the Jeopardy competition and creating question answering frameworks. And so part of the talk uh, today is going to be flavored by uh, my interest both as a natural language processing researcher and also as uh, someone who's very, very much into trivia. Uh, so what makes for a good question? Uh, here is a list that I came up with, and you may disagree uh, with this, and if you do, I, I would love to have a, a longer uh, discussion about this in the Q&A session. Uh, but uh, I would say that um, a good question should be able to reason across sentences, uh, should be written by experts, should be able to compare and compete with humans in a valid way, and should measure the uncertainty of the underlying machine learning algorithms, and also advance science. And uh, one of the earliest question answering systems that kind of broke onto the scene in the last uh, decade and, and sort of the, uh, the neural explosion uh, was Squad uh, from uh, Percy Liang and uh, company. And so there you do have to reason across sentences and, and so that's great. So that satisfies property number one. Uh, another one, Trivia QA, is, is written by experts and um, has a lot of variation. So, so that's another good quality. And we saw a lot of work addressing these sorts of data sets and computers did really, really well. And after you saw those systems come out, you had news articles like this, basically declaring the question answering was solved, uh, machines are better than humans. And that's completely bogus. I can talk more about that. Uh, if, if folks are interested. 
one of the things, however, that even the creators of Squad realize is that Squad is always answerable. And when you ask a question to Siri or Alexa, the questions you ask are sometimes difficult. And uh, these systems need to figure out when they don't know the answer. Uh, so uh, Squad 2.0 addresses this. And there you need to decide, do I have enough information to answer this question, yes or no? But uh, this is in some ways a solved problem. The trivia community has been uh, trying to decide, uh, given system A, system B, in say four people uh, from schools trying to compete in a trivia tournament, which one is better? And the gold standard there is something called quiz bowl, where a moderator reads a question and uh, both teams try to answer and they interrupt the question and buzz in. It's a little hard to explain, so let me do this. Um, uh, in uh, an example form, but uh, I, I need the audience to participate. So uh, what I would like you to do is uh, to use uh, the chat function. And uh, when you know uh, the uh, answer to the question, uh, please uh, give your uh, answer in the chat. So you will need to interrupt me in the chat. So as soon as you know the answer to the question, uh, type it into chat. OK, uh, everybody clear on what's going on? All right. I, I will take the silence as a yes. Okay, so I will start reading the question. As soon as you know the answer, uh, type it into chat. Okay, <clears throat> this man wrote a ballet in which 60 white nymphs performed the rainbow dance, so named because different colored lights are focused on them. That ballet, Alethes uh, and Iris, was never produced uh, because the theater manager was convinced it would cause a fire. So uh, Mirko buzzed in with uh, Stravinsky. Uh, that is a good guess, but incorrect. So uh, keep on coming with the guesses. He invented the first cow catcher and campaign for passage of an act against street musicians, like outdoor musicians who claimed he wasted a quarter of his life. He, Tchaikovsky is also incorrect, uh, so uh, uh, but a good guess, Tobias. Uh, he responded to William Wells' statement that no scientific explanation of the universe was possible in his Ninth Bridgewater Treatise, which attacked the eight previous treatises funded by the Earl of Bridgewater. He also wrote about the influence of aristocrats on science and his reflections on the decline of science in England. Uh, this author of the memoir, Passages from the Life of a Philosopher, improved on Jacquard's invention of punched cards by proposing a device which incorporated an input storage system processor, control unit, and output device. For 10 points, identify this inventor of the analytic engine and the difference engine. Okay, so uh, uh, it looks like JJ and Conrad uh, both uh, uh, typed Babbage, uh, the correct answer, at about the right time, but Conrad got in first, uh, so uh, he gets uh, 10 points. Uh, and, and the question is indeed Charles Babbage. Uh, and so what you can notice about these questions is that they're, they're really long, and, and this may put some people off at first, but um, when you're dealing with experts, uh, they will know things like, uh, uh, the rainbow dance and Alethes, uh, and so they will interrupt the question early on and you won't hear all of the question. And the questions get easier and easier as you go along so that you can discriminate who knows the most about a particular topic, who is better at question answering. And so uh, I won't go through uh, the same thing. Uh, here's another example. The answer is Moscow, and you can see that it ends with uh, what's the capital of Russia? And so that's a very easy way of asking a question where the answer is uh, Moscow. And at the very beginning, it's talking about uh, Antonio Solari. So uh, questions start uh, very difficult and uh, get easy. And so uh, uh, after Quiz Bowl, you're deciding after every word whether you can answer the question or not. And this is different from Jeopardy, where it's basically a race uh, of all the people who know the answer, who can mash a button the fastest. So uh, Jeopardy is not as good at discriminating uh, who knows the most about a topic. And I can talk more about uh, the differences between Jeopardy and Quiz Bowl if, if folks have questions about that. Okay, so uh, let's go through the checklist again. Uh, does it reason across uh, sentences? Yes, uh, both in the, the source material that you're answering from, say Wikipedia, and also within the question itself, because these questions are, are rather long. They're written by experts. Um, uh, there's a complicated authoring and editing process in the trivia community. Uh, can you compare and compete with humans? Yes, by design, because this is how humans uh, decide who is better at uh, answering trivia questions. And uh, does it test uncertainty? Yes, again, by design, you need to decide after every word uh, whether to answer a question or not. And does it advance science? Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that 
uh, later, and, and I obviously think that it does. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about how you can solve this problem. Um, and so because this is a relatively high level talk, I won't go too much into the details, but uh, I back up slides in case anyone does want to go into the details and we can talk about uh, more of the nitty gritty, but uh, I'll be talking very much at a high level uh, today. Okay, uh, but uh, there are two ways of, of solving this problem and two components of solving this problem. One is deciding what to answer and one is deciding when to answer. So let's first talk about uh, how to decide what to answer first. And so uh, this is work uh, by my student, Shin. Uh, this is the latest in a progression of things uh, that we've done to try to answer this question. So two broad ways of trying to answer questions are to use either knowledge bases like Freebase, Wikidata, uh, Yago, and things like that, uh, or to use free text like Squad and uh, other uh, approaches have done in the past. And uh, we're going to try to combine the best of both worlds. Uh, the, uh, the approaches uh, that use uh, knowledge bases uh, have really good precision, uh, but the text-based approaches have really good recall. So can we get the best of both worlds? And uh, we approach this problem in, a, in the following way. We're going to build a knowledge graph based on text, the text in Wikipedia. And these knowledge graphs will be grounded in a question. And then once we have that graph, we're going to use graph neural networks to try to figure out which of the possible uh, entities or text bands answer the question. And so uh, in the knowledge graph that we built, the nodes are Wikipedia in entries. We have edges that connect these uh, uh, nodes, and these edges are annotated with free text that we extract from Wikipedia. And uh, we look for sentences to connect two nodes where nodes appear together in Wikipedia. So uh, either in one page mentioning another, uh, or uh, a single sentence that mentions two entities. Uh, so uh, uh, Alfred Einstein uh, invented a refrigerator with Leo Szilard. Okay, so uh, again, this is easier with an example. So let's take a, a look at uh, this question. So Verbeer painted a series of cityscapes of this, of what Dutch city, including the little street. Uh, so you can uh, first extract all the entities that are mentioned in the question. Uh, then you can see all of the uh, entities that are linked to this in Wikipedia in some way. Uh, so the left-hand side here are the uh, entities in the question, the question entities, and then on the right-hand side we have all the candidate entities. And in a real question there would be hundreds of these. I'm only showing two. Uh, we then uh, build a grounded knowledge graph uh, by connecting up uh, all the places where Vermeer and Delft appear together uh, in a question. And uh, we then use a graph neural network to reason about which of these nodes on the right-hand side might be the uh, correct answer. And we can look for the clues in the sentence that point to what might be used uh, to answer the question. And so uh, uh, we have a neural network that learns from data how to do this. Uh, again, I won't talk about the details, uh, but happy to answer questions about that. Uh, and we're, we're able to do better than uh, the state of the art uh, text only based systems, uh, either looking at uh, a single sentence or uh, looking at multiple sentences at once. And we seem to do better when there are more entities in a question. Okay, so uh, that was a whirlwind introduction to how uh, you can answer these sorts of questions. Uh, by figuring out what to answer. But the other part of playing uh, Quiz Bowl, which is kind of unique, is deciding when to answer the question. And uh, this is called buzzing in. So when you were sitting there uh, at, uh, at home, uh, trying to figure out, uh, I, it might be Tchaikovsky, should I, should I type that in the chat or not? That's, that's what these systems have to do. And uh, uh, this is work uh, by my student, uh, ha -ha, who is now an assistant professor at New York uh, University. And so uh, we wanted to know if our system could be better than humans. So we built an online app so that people could play Quiz Bowl online. It was so popular that um, it's uh, now been bootlegged and people have been playing this for about a decade. And we, we figured out that there are a lot of different play styles for playing this game. And uh, my student Haha adapted some of the uh, reinforcement learning techniques uh, from uh, 
uh, DeepMind's work on playing Atari uh, to adapt to playing this uh, with an opponent, where you need to figure out, I am not just basing this on my own knowledge, I need to know, uh, will the uh, opponent get this before I do? And so uh, uh, her models uh, play a bunch of games uh, with these opponents online and learn how to take advantage of weaker opponents. That uh, if you have figured out that your opponent doesn't know a particular uh, category, so I'm playing against Joe, Joe doesn't know history, I can take my time on history and wait until I'm 100% confident that, that this uh, answer is correct. Uh, but uh, if I'm playing against Joe and Joe knows science, then I need to be much more aggressive in deciding when to buzz. And so uh, once you build in this opponent modeling, uh, you can uh, decrease the percentage of time that your, uh, your system miscalibrates their, their own knowledge. And this is important for things like uh, when you go on the web and you type in an answer, um, uh, not all uh, search engines need to give you an answer to every question. And really, they should decide to withhold answers sometimes if they're going to give you a really stupid answer. OK. Uh, so uh, we, we put all these pieces together, and uh, we, we basically had a road show where we took our system out on the road, and uh, we played against uh, top teams of humans. And uh, in our first match, we played against four people who had won a bunch of money on this Jeopardy uh, TV show. And uh, this was rather embarrassing. Our system did better than we expected. We thought we were going to lose um, and be very embarrassed, but uh, it ended in a 200-200 tie. And um, uh, the, the, the human team wanted to play tiebreaker questions, but our system just shut down because it was only meant to play 40 questions, and uh, uh, that, that was its purpose in life. So the humans declared themselves the victor of that match, uh, probably fairly, uh, since we were not expecting a tie. Uh, we, we then played uh, Ken Jennings. Um, about a year later, who uh, won the most money on Jeopardy and recently won the greatest of all time tournament. Uh, and uh, our system handily beat him. Uh, but then the uh, trivia community said, well, Ken Jennings and all these other folks are, are uh, nice and all, but they're not necessarily the best at playing Quiz Bowl. So um, uh, the Quiz Bowl community assembled um, a, a team of experts and, and handily beat uh, another system. Uh, uh, a year later, we came back and we narrowly beat a, a team of humans. So uh, we're, we're, we're basically on par with humans at this point. Uh, does this mean that uh, everything is solved? And uh, I would argue no, uh, because what the computers are doing is, is not really all that deep. And so uh, I'm going to, to jump ahead a little bit in the interest of time. Uh, the um, Uh, the questions that I showed you have this property where they start out hard and they get easier over time. And the fact that the computer is able to answer these questions early means that they're able to answer questions that are hard for humans. That doesn't mean that they're able to answer questions that are hard for computers. Uh, but what does that even mean? Uh, so many of the questions uh, are written that are hard for humans, try to test recall. Uh, and uh, humans don't have infinite memory, but computers do. And any question that contains a quote or a clue that has been asked before in another question are really easy for a computer to memorize and then just not think about. It can just copy paste the answer. Really what we want to do is we want to create questions that are difficult for computers and to create better questions so that we can build better systems. So uh, this is uh, uh, something that we worked on with um, uh, the following system. We created an interface so that people could create questions and uh, try to stump our pretty good uh, question answering system. And then it, it can play in a competition against tons of different question answering systems from all around the world uh, and also against top players. So the, the interface looked a little something like this. You start uh, by typing in the answer to your question. Uh, then you start typing in your question. And uh, it shows not only what our question answering system is thinking and why it is thinking that um, a particular answer uh, might be the answer. You can then go in and 
uh, change up your question. So in this case, uh, it knows that variations on a theme by Haydn, it, whenever you see that, uh, you should answer Brahms and it'll be correct. So if you rewrite the question by not mentioning the name of that musical piece uh, directly, but instead talk about it in a, a roundabout way, um, by mentioning uh, the job of the person who wrote it and, and things like that, uh, it's the same information, just phrased in a different way. And humans uh, can answer these sorts of questions uh, relatively easily, but it makes it a lot more difficult for a computer. And uh, you can keep on going in, until uh, you've finished writing your questions. And at some point, it gets really, really hard to write a question that stumps a computer and is still answerable by a human. Uh, so at some point, the computer will answer it. But the, the goal of this inter interface is to try to push that a little bit later so that humans and computers are kind of on uh, equal playing field. Uh, okay, so uh, we, we had a competition uh, against a team of top quiz bowlers. Um, uh, we had a warm up on, on normal questions written for humans by humans, and uh, the computer got four out of five of them right. Uh, but in the actual match, uh, uh, the score was 300 to 30 uh, in favor of the humans on these adversarially written questions. And so this shows that. Uh, this is uh, pretty difficult uh, for computers to answer, but the humans didn't find it any more difficult. And so uh, that was against uh, uh, two systems, uh, one from uh, 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 Japan, uh, Uzia, uh, probably the best uh, trivia uh, question answering system in the world right now, uh, but they were written against our system. Uh, but two systems uh, are not all of natural language processing and machine learning, so we held uh, an event that was open to anybody in the world. Any human trivia team could enter, any uh, computer team could enter. Uh, we had a bunch of teams uh, come in, and every computer team lost to every human team, uh, even a, a pretty weak human team that was uh, just uh, 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 two high school students from down the road. Um, but uh, the, the two games were, were really close. The, the strongest uh, computer system based on BERT uh, had some close games against some of the human teams, uh, and, and those were fun to watch. And if you're interested in watching them, uh, you can check out my YouTube channel. I'll have a link at the end so you can check it out. OK, so uh, let's talk a little bit about how these questions are difficult for computers. What makes them hard? So uh, here's an example of uh, what's called a common link question in uh, the, the trivia universe, where you have a bunch of characters from a bunch of works, and they're all named uh, Rebecca. And uh, the computer gets confused by all these different people, and uh, the, it can figure out each of these clues individually, but it's not able to figure out what do they all have in common. And so uh, that's uh, something that a human can do quite easily, uh, but it's pretty hard for a computer. Uh, and then here is an interesting question where you have um, a question talking about a single thing in many different aspects. So you have elements of history, elements of geography, uh, elements of uh, social science, and they're all talking about the Andes, uh, but the system isn't able to figure out how these different aspects of the same topic all fit together. And this is my very favorite question that came out of this competition and uh, shows the uh, uh, brilliance of, of the people who were writing these questions against the system. So uh, here is a, a little snippet of a question. And uh, you may look at this and uh, think, uh, hey, oh yeah, I know this one. Uh, this is Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky. Uh, uh, wrote Crime and Punishment, and that's exactly what computers think as well. But uh, the computer didn't just see this, it also saw the beginning of this question that starts, the main character of a story by this author opens Crime and Punishment. And pragmatically, you know that Dostoevsky wasn't a crazy author, at least in this way. Uh, Dostoevsky was kind of a classic literary author, and he's not going to write about himself, so you know that the answer to this question is probably not going to be uh, Dostoevsky. And linguistically, you can notice that uh, this author opens Crime and Punishment is an embedded clause, uh, and a story by this author 
open to crime and punishment, probably is not referring to Dostoevsky here. And so if you go on, uh, you get additional clues like Madame Bovary uh, that was written after Crime and Punishment. And so you know, and uh, that's not Dostoevsky. Uh, so every computer system got this wrong in some way. Many uh, buzzed in really early and, and tried to answer uh, Dostoevsky. Um, but uh, if you get to the end of the question, uh, humans uh, are able to answer that uh, this is a coup de gala. Uh, the author of Rashomon, and uh, the, the top humans are able to uh, answer based on the Naigu clue uh, from a fairly famous short story. And one thing that was interesting is that we had a couple of different uh, question answering systems that people could write against. Uh, they could either use an information retrieval system uh, to write their questions. Um, uh, uh, so that's, that's in green here. Uh, or they could write their questions against a neural system. Uh, that's in blue here. And uh, so questions were hard uh, on systems, uh, sorry, let, let me start over. Uh, the accuracy drops uh, for the IR questions, no matter what system you're using to try to answer the questions. Um, but if you write uh, questions against the neural interface, so you try to avoid things that the neural system knows, uh, those seem to be relatively brittle, and an IR system is able to do relatively well on that. So you can see that the blue and red uh, dots here are relatively close. So red are the normal questions. So uh, if you use uh, a stupid information retrieval-based system to answer these questions, it still does relatively well. Okay, um, so I, I want to switch gears a little bit, and so I really like talking about trivia, as, as you've probably noticed. But um, this isn't all fun and games. There are really neat connections to uh, other things. And in uh, particular, one thing that I want to talk about is uh, simultaneous interpretation. So um, this is really, really hard. So this is when you're sitting in a room with someone uh, speaking a language like, say, German, and you need to translate that into real time uh, as they are saying the sentence. So it's not a so-called consecutive translation where someone says a sentence in German, then you say a sentence in English, they wait for you to finish. Uh, they're not going to wait, they're going to just keep talking and uh, you need to translate uh, as they go along. So this is the norm in the United Nations, uh, in the European Parliament, it's really hard. So a single human cannot do this alone, they work in pairs, uh, it takes years of training. Um, and uh, computers are not able to be trusted for this, for high level negotiations and uh, uh, for business meetings and, and things like that. So you need to have really expensive humans to do this. Uh, but uh, just like question answering, computers and humans have different strengths. So computers have infinite memory. Uh, they can translate numbers just like this. And uh, this is really hard for humans to do because numbers uh, are hard to fit into memory. And uh, there are often crazy uh, orderings between the way that you say numbers uh, so like uh, in, in uh, German becomes 25, uh, French is even crazier, and Japanese is uh, even worse. Um, but if you look at how you might build a system to do simultaneous interpretation, it looks a little bit like the quiz bowl problem. You have text coming in, and you have a system making predictions about how it could translate a sentence. And your system needs to decide, am I confident enough about uh, my translation to say, guess what the verb of a German sentence is going to be, because German verbs often come at the end of the sentence. Um, and if so, I need to uh, decide I'm going to commit to uh, guessing that this verb is going to be travel and translate that. And that's a lot like uh, being confident on a quizable question and buzzing in with that answer. And so uh, as you go along, you collect points. And so this, again, is like the quizable game. You're deciding of the stuff that I haven't translated yet, am I confident enough to buzz in? And uh, one thing that I would like to see is more human-computer uh, collaboration, where human and computers can work together uh, and hopefully form a better team than either of them would be able to do individually. And uh, I, I think that uh, question answering is really exciting field right now, and, and this is something where I'm, I'm looking for collaborations and uh, uh, one of the reasons that I came to Switzerland for my sabbatical was to build new collaborations in the area of question answering. And uh, I haven't been able to visit uh, schools uh, 
uh, and universities and uh, companies in the area as much as I would like. Uh, I was always I was saying, oh, I'll do that at the end of my sabbatical, and then uh, coronavirus happened. Uh, so um, I, I would I would still love to have these sorts of conversations. Um, and uh, I, I think there are a lot of areas for uh, new and exciting challenges. So uh, question answering is exciting in, in kind of a, a showmanship kind of way, because this is something where you can get hundreds of people to show up uh, for these live events. Uh, it's something that people understand, people like to play along with, as, as, as you saw when you were typing in your uh, guesses into the chat. And you need both knowledge and language comprehension to go well. And if we're ever going to uh, solve the holy grail challenge of passing the Turing test, uh, we need to understand both of those. Um, and at, at the moment, it's still very much the case that if you write questions in the way that I described, uh, uh, computers really struggle, even though they dominate on, on so-called normal questions. And uh, we're, we're building up an infrastructure for future events and, and courses. Um, uh, I, I, I Very soon, I, I was hoping I could announce it today, but uh, not quite yet. Uh, we're holding a NeurIPS competition uh, in December of this year um, uh, for human computer competition. And uh, if you're interested in question answering, I, I hope you uh, join in. Uh, follow me on Twitter or uh, uh, look at my webpage, and I will post that just as soon as I can. Um, and so if you want to check out the code that I talked about today, uh, you can check it out here or go to quanta.org, uh, where quanta stands for question answering is not a trivial activity. Um, this isn't the only thing that I work on. I have a relatively large group at the University of Maryland. We also work on computational social science, interactive machine learning, uh, sentiment and internal state, uh, and uh, multilingual topic models. So uh, if you're interested in any of those things, I'd, I'd love to have those conversations as well. Uh, but with that, um, I will uh, thank my collaborators who uh, helped uh, put this work together. And uh, I'll leave up this uh, slide with links, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions.